from Upwave Media. Welcome to the Peace Buzz for August 26, 2016. This is your host, Serena Blaze, coming to you from Oklahoma City, where our sponsoring organization, the Center for Conscience and Action, is located. For many, this may sound like a remote outpost in the peace community, but in fact, we have a lot of activity and resources here to draw from, and one of those is Nyla Ali Khan, who teaches at the University of Oklahoma. Professor Khan comes from Kashmir, which is a region under the control of India, and which has a very interesting recent history and currently a good bit of turmoil that needs to be better understood and addressed by the rest of the world. Having Professor Khan nearby gives us an opportunity to try to remedy that, and we spoke with her at length back in April. Sadly, things have not improved for Kashmir, and today we check in again with Nyla to see what is happening and what we might be able to do to help the pro-democracy movement there find peaceful solutions to decades of mistrust and resentment. The interview was conducted on August 19th. I want to welcome back Nyla Ali Khan to Peace Buzz, and um, what what I wanted to do was to get an update from her about what's been going on in Kashmir. Uh, we talked to her earlier this year, and unfortunately things have not really improved in the region, so we want to find out... Um, uh, what's going on, what, what um, events have occurred. But first I'm going to ask you, Nyla, to, just for those who didn't hear the previous podcast, just give us a brief introduction about that region and the, and the politics there. Um, hi, Irina. I'm delighted to be back on Peace Buzz. So Jammu and Kashmir is currently a state in the Indian Union. And the entire state, part of which is in Pakistan, a small part in China, is politically disputed territory. And militancy or an armed insurrection erupted in Indian administered Jammu and Kashmir in 1989. Uh, so it's, the state has been politically turbulent since then because of the forces of armed insurrection as well as counter-insurgency. Um, intergovernmental organizations as well as human rights organizations have been critical of the human rights violations that have taken place in the state since then. Uh, there has been an attempt by the government of India to resuscitate the political process as well as political institutions by holding elections every six years. But the problem remains the alienation of the people from the mainstream, from mainstream politics. The problem remains the anger, the rage of the younger generation in particular which has grown up during the years of armed insurgency and counterinsurgency. The government of India can do a lot more to mitigate the conflict, and the government of India can do a lot more to lessen the alienation and the resentment by perhaps uh, restoring the autonomous status of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. You see, when Jammu and Kashmir acceded to what was then the dominion of India in 1947, it was a princely state. So when the monarch of the state signed the instrument of accession to India, it was done with the understanding that the government of India would have control over three areas, foreign affairs, communications, and defense. 
and the other areas would be under the control of the state government. But since 1953, which is the year that the democratically elected Prime Minister of Jammu and Kashmir, who was my maternal grandfather, he was ousted and arrested by Prime Minister Nehru's government. The reason he was ousted and arrested was because even after becoming Premier, he did not give up the demand for self-determination for the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So the, the result was that he was ousted. A democratically elected government by was, India. By the, absolutely by the government of India. So a democratically elected government was undemocratically removed. And since 1953, the government of India has consistently and systematically eroded the constitution of the state, as well as the autonomous status of the state, leading to great disillusionment. Now, the, dis the disillusionment of the populace and the sense of alienation in the younger generation in particular was worsened by the government of Pakistan, which added fuel to the fire and aided and abetted the militant resistance morally, psychologically, economically, by providing arms and ammunition. They aided and abetted that resistance without, uh, without a substantive policy, without a blueprint, without looking into how that kind of resistance was unsustainable. And, and would it be correct to say that that uh, because Pakistan and India, of course, have been hostile uh, nations to each other, that they were sort of using that um, that uh, uh, political situation to get at India? Basically, it was part of the it was part of the the India Pakistan thing. It wasn't they weren't probably motivated for I think the, that is absolutely correct. The, I think the that J is and K yeah. people, right? I think so. that is absolutely correct. And of course when we say J and K just that's Jammu and Kashmir. Absolutely. And, absolutely. and this is a, a region of the country um, southeast of Afghanistan. Absolutely. So and when we when I spoke to you earlier this spring, um, an incident had happened that provoked um, I think what you referred to as counterinsurgency, mm -hmm. um, and there there were worldwide um, vigils, vigils, candlelight Can vigils. It, so has have the has the current is the current situation um, and the evolution of that still part of that kind of um, event and and continuing of that, or is it so, is, is yeah. something else happening now? Yeah, that's a very good question. The problem with the response of the government of India to the militant movement in Kashmir is that they have chosen to respond belligerently, aggressively, employing military means instead of employing political diplomacy instead of initiating dialogue with all stakeholders and negotiations. There is a large section of the populace of Jammu and Kashmir that is still ecumenical. A large section of the populace that would still veer away from the forces of Talibanization that would veer away from the forces of radicalization or a any kind of monocultural identity. Right. And I'll, I'll remind listeners that India is primarily Hindu, Pakistan is primarily Muslim. Absolutely. Now the difference between the two in terms of their respective constitutions is that Pakistan is now a theocratic country 
or an Islamic Republic. And India constitutionally is a secular republic, although the current federal government is the current federal government subscribes to a right wing Hindutva ideology and is ultra nationalistic. And that ideology is very clearly reflected in the response of this government to any signs of dissent or any signs of insurrection in Kashmir. And I think Americans, at least for myself, um, can relate this to right-wing reaction in the United States to acts of terrorism, the, the immediate response is to, to militarize it rather than deal with things on a, in terms of a criminal persecution, um, a prosecution, or or as you mentioned, transitional you justice know, mechanisms, or, or, or diplomacy yeah. as needed, and etc. That it really, I mean, it, and we saw this in you know after uh, uh, 2001, you know, uh, and other incidents that have happened. That kind of spur, you know, immediate militaristic and belligerent reaction really long term does not have positive effects. So I'm just trying to give give myself and other people a basis for understanding what's going on in, in Kashmir. So I think um, that's a very good analogy, Wina. Thank that's you. That's a really good analogy. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, and I know, you know, and, I, and I'm I'm guilty of this as much as anybody. But Americans know so little about mm -hmm. the rest of the world, mm -hmm. and and this area, of course, I mean, we, the United States, as far as I know, is not militaristically in um, in Kashmir and Jammu, but but certainly has a role in Indian and Pakistani um, conflict, mm -hmm. and in that general region, of course, in Afghanistan and in the wider region. Um, and so that's one of the things I asked you when we, when we talked in between um, our visits, is how does the situation there play into the greater um, uh, uh, situation in, in global politics in terms of fighting, you know, the so-called war on terror? You know, does that I think I read your, your recent article, uh, Belligerent Leaders Using Nationalistic and Religious Rhetoric to Mask Geopolitical Aims, and that was published in the South Asian Citizens Web. As um, well as counterpunch okay. in this country. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, you seem to be saying that, um, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a danger in, in the reaction that's been used, and that really the a better approach would be to give autonomous self-determination to these these uh, these regions. I think the problem with the reaction to militant resistance in Kashmir, and just real quick for your listeners, I would like to tell them that a couple of months ago, a young militant commander, a 22-year-old militant commander, was killed by Indian paramilitary personnel. And the reaction to his killing was unexpected. There was a lot of anger, a lot of fury, a lot of protest marches and demonstrations uh, that were taken out by ordinary people who were not connected with militancy or necessarily with the militant movement. Now, I think the people involved in those protests and demonstrations, all of them might not have been angry just about the death of this militant commander, but I think it was the simmering resentment, the simmering frustration, the simmering alienation to which fuel was added by the killing of this young man who had become a social media icon. Now, I am very critical of any attempt to romanticize militancy, and I don't think that leads to constructive politics. But when a nation state, one as powerful as India, which is a growing military and economic power, responds to insurgency in one of its units in a belligerent way, 
The result is that the forces of radicalization gain legitimacy because ordinary people are pushed to the wall. And even those who have been resisting the discourse and forces of radicalization and who are a lot more ecumenical in their politics and culture, when they see this kind of militaristic response, they think, where do I turn? Right. And, and you use the term simmering, which I think is, is perhaps being too kind because you, you know, we're going back to 1953 and I happen to know that that's a long time because I was born in 1953. <laughs> and so if, if really, if your if you're, if you're region, your nation, your, your, you know, your, your unit is, is waiting that long for some kind of political resolution, I mean, little good can come from that. It's just, especially when there are differences. I mean, I look at, you know, in, in our country, um, the differences in faith, in culture, uh, in race, and, and those things all become elements in, in promoting um, resentment and, and, and soliciting violence on one side or the other. And I, you know, the same thing. I mean, human beings are the same wherever yes, you they are. are. You know? So, so is there? I mean, can the can the United States or can even the the peace movement globally have um, some kind of an impact in in seeking, you know, in in, in addressing particular people or nations about the situation to try to prompt better better activity in I, I think that's a really really good question uh, before I respond to that I would like to go back to your earlier question about India and Pakistan using Kashmir as a bargaining chip mm -hmm. and I think that's a very valid point because a lot of Kashmiris raise the slogan of self-determination or plebiscite with sincerity but for a lot of people in Kashmir, milita military officials, political actors, mainstream as well as separatists, bureaucrats, and also military and bureaucratic officials in India and Pakistan, the slogan of self-determination or plebiscite has become simply rhetorical. It's become a way to, again, it's become a bargaining chip. The slogans of self-determination, autonomy for Kashmir have become rhetorical. There are points when India gets belligerent and tells Pakistan that they need to vacate the portion of Kashmir that they hold, that they need to demilitarize the portion of Kashmir that they hold and give human rights and civil liberties to the populace of Kashmir on their side of the border. Then Pakistan decides to respond just as aggressively and cries itself hoarse about the Kashmiri people's right of self-determination. And then both countries, in whenever there is a spell of camaraderie or they decide to establish affable, amicable relationships, then both of them put the Kashmiri people's right of self-determination on the back burner. You see? So there is a lack of sincerity, there is a lack of political will on both sides of the border to resolve the issue. And one of the biggest problems that exists in Indian-administered Kashmir as well as Pakistani-administered Kashmir is that any political actor to gain legitimacy, must enjoy the support, must enjoy the blessings of the establishment. So a political actor, a mainstream political actor, in order to be successful in Jammu and Kashmir, would require the blessings as well as the patronage of the government of India. Separatist politicians in Jammu and Kashmir would require the patronage of the government of Pakistan, the military of Pakistan. In the Kashmir on the Pakistani side, 
no political actor is eligible for running for office unless he or she enjoys the patronage of the Pakistani military. You see? Mm -hmm. So that depoliticization of the indigenous political space and criminalization of dissident politics on both sides of the border is particularly troubling and has led to the brutalization of Kashmiri society. It has clearly and will continue to have long-term damaging effects. When excesses, whether they are military or religious or political, are not curbed, they have terrible long-term effects, damaging effects. And when religion and politics are conflated, especially in a movement for self-determination, that is a problem. The rest of the world, the world community, turns a blind eye to those movements for self-determination that are presented in the garb of religion or religious discourse, in which there is no separation of religion and politics, particularly in this day and age with the growth of ISIS, Taliban, etc. If religion and politics are not deliberately and carefully separated in a movement for self-determination, the world community becomes suspicious. So we need to make sure that the political dimension of the movement for self-determination in Kashmir is highlighted, is showcased. And yes, peace activists can do a lot by highlighting human rights violations that occur, human rights violations for which the government, as well as militant organizations, are responsible. Of course, as responsible citizens, we need to hold up a mirror to the state government, as well as to the federal government. And we can do that more easily because they are accountable to us in a democratic setup, more accountable than militant organizations are. But human rights violations on both sides need to be highlighted, need to be showcased. Right. So who are, who are the agents that would, when, you know, a, 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 a movement, a, a, an organization, like maybe Amnesty or something, what, who are the agents that they could address? At, at, you know, in it's seeking some solutions. All right. So the current response of the government of India to amnesty has not been very favorable. It's not been very amicable. Uh, the government of India has has uh, made it clear to amnesty that they don't want them to interfere in Kashmir. And the United Nations Human Rights Commission sought permission from the governments of India and Pakistan to probe into complaints of human rights violations in Indian-administered Kashmir as well as Pakistani-administered Kashmir. Uh, a couple of days ago, or maybe yesterday, the government of Pakistan made a statement that, um, that the United Nations Human Rights Commission was welcome to go to their side of Kashmir and was welcome to probe into complaints of human rights violations on their side of Kashmir. Now, I don't know if that statement was simply rhetorical. And it's not yet been followed up on. It, it has not been yet been followed up last. on. Yeah. But the government of India has denied the UN Human Rights Commission, okay. their permission to enter their side of Kashmir and the permission to probe into 
any complaint of human rights violations on their side of Kashmir. So um, right now, the government of India is calling the shots as far as that goes. You're listening to Peace Buzz. We're speaking to Naila Ali Khan about unrest in Kashmir and surrounding areas where people are releasing years of pent-up frustration about lack of democratic government and accountability. The region, controlled primarily by India, is being impacted negatively by the political situation within India itself. And at this point in the interview, I asked about how the regional Amnesty International Network was dealing with things. It was a very timely question because just a day or two before, ultra-right protest in Bangalore or Bengaluru, India, had forced the local amnesty office to close for the safety of its staff. The protests were directly related to the relationship between India and Kashmir. We paused to look up breaking news on the incident, and Nyla read from a news report while providing some context about the various players. ABVP protests against Amnesty International. ABVP is a right-wing ultra-nationalist organization that is affiliated with the party that is currently in power in India. And that organization tried to enter Amnesty's Bangalore office, but they were stopped by the police and they have been staging demonstrations against Amnesty because this organization filed a complaint against Amnesty alleging that an event it held in Bangalore on the ongoing crisis in the Kashmir Valley was anti-national. A sedition case has been filed against Amnesty, even though it denied the charges. And acting on the advice of the Bangalore police, Amnesty has shot its offices in the city. Wow. Yeah. So the well, this of, just highlights what you're talking about. Absolutely. It really does. Absolutely. So the head of Amnesty's India division said that the federal government needed to uphold the freedom of expression guaranteed in the Indian constitution. He added that the sedition law was being misused by several state governments to silence activists who were critical of government policies which highlights what I'm saying, exactly. which is why the international community needs to get involved. And I think in order to get the international community involved, the onus lies on the populace of Kashmir, the onus lies on those claiming to lead the political movement for self-determination to separate religion and politics to present this movement in a more ecumenical form to which world activists can relate, which world activists would like to take forward without any kind of allegation being leveled against them, without any kind of, uh, without, without those activists becoming suspicious of the motives behind the movement for self-determination. Because in this day and age, the growth of bigotry, the growth of fanaticism, and I'm not just talking about organizations like ISIS and the Taliban, but Christian fanaticism, uh, Hindu fanaticism, uh, Jewish fanaticism, we see those fundamentalisms rearing their ugly heads the world over. That is a reality. And in the wake of 9-11, the world has become increasingly polarized. There is a divide between us and them. A very carefully constructed divide between, within quotes, the civilized world and the barbaric world. And that's the paradigm within which we operate. So that needs to be kept in mind when we seek to take political movements for people's rights forward. Right. So uh, hopefully in a more positive vein, you went back uh, within the last couple of months 
uh, you went back to the area and you you uh, I saw on, on Facebook uh, that you had given you gave some lectures you talked to people you visited universities and and I think uh, community groups can you tell us a little bit about some of the positive um, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. things that you you did absolutely. and and learned while you were there. So I spent six weeks in Kashmir this summer, and I went to quite a few colleges. I went to a couple of university campuses more than a couple of times, and all these institutions are in rural areas. A couple of them are in backwaters. And I went to these places as an academic. I met with a lot of students, girls as well as boys. Um, I talked with them about their academic ambitions. I talked with them about their academic projects. I talked with them about um, applied theory, about learning to find ways to converge literary theory and politics or ground realities, mm -hmm. pragmatic politics and literary theory. And I had very interesting conversations with a lot of students as well as faculty. What I saw in these rural areas, even in backwaters, was curiosity, inquisitiveness, a desire to know more about the outside world, a desire to explore, a desire to find parallels between the political, cultural situation that those kids are living in and other parts of the world, a desire to forge boundaries across religious divides, across ideological divides. So to find common ground, between agendas of groups affected by conflict in other parts of the world and those students, mm -hmm. you see? So um, there is a lot of intelligence there. There is a lot of ambition there. There is an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. There is a desire to reach their full potential despite everything that those children have been going through for the past 26 years now. And they are dealing with, remember, not just militarization and brutalization caused by governments, but they are dealing with a militant movement as well. They are dealing with an attempt to conflate politics and religion as well. Now, religion is a very important aspect of South Asian societies, as it has become an important aspect of, of American society as well in this day and age. But So religion being such an important aspect of South Asian societies, it cannot be dismissed. It cannot be written off. It has to be recognized as a force. Mm -hmm. It has to be recognized as an important dimension of South Asia. And, in, and sensible, intelligent states people would find ways to accommodate religious identities within secular framework. Mm -hmm so that religious discourse does not become exclusionary, but is inclusive. So that religious discourse recognizes the need for an ecumenical political framework. So that, relig so that people are able to practice their religions, their faiths, which they hold very dear, within a political and cultural framework that is amenable to mm -hmm. positive, constructive outside influences. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Right, and there's tolerance for, there's the, tolerance. for the differences, right? Absolutely. So what is the situation uh, in terms of the opportunity uh, for education from girls, especially even younger than the college and university students you were meeting with? It is, is it difficult for girls to uh, get educated um, 
in that area? Well, uh, the, uh, the literacy rate for women, for girls, is relatively high in Kashmir. I'm not talking about the quality of education. I'm not talking about opportunities or lack thereof after they graduate. But the literacy rate is relatively high. Of course, Kashmir is a conservative society. So girls have always faced cultural barriers. And there is a lack of um, cultural empowerment, even though women in that part of the world are politically empowered in terms of the constitution giving them the right to vote, the right to run for public office, the right to an equal education, equal work for equal pay. So they enjoy those constitutional rights, but to what extent those rights are implemented is the million dollar question. You see, it's now that we see a woman presidential candidate in the United States even though women have enjoyed this constitutional right for decades, forever. So it's taken a long time for this to come about. Mm -hmm. Likewise, Kashmir uh, women enjoy these political rights, and currently uh, we have a woman head of government who clearly is not very successful given the political turbulence in that state. Um, but there are cultural barriers that women run into. And then also interpretations of religion. Not every interpretation of religion is enlightened. Not every interpretation of religion is emancipatory. And that's true everywhere. That's true everywhere. <laughs> so there are some interpretations that limit the growth of women. Mm -hmm. So when, when you go back there, are you, I mean, and you have a status as an academic, you know, a noted academic and author in the United States as well as back there, are you somewhat unique? Are you a, a rarity? Are there others, um, uh, other women like you who, you know, uh, uh, have that kind of status and, and ability to go around and speak to uh, young people? Uh, you know, my mother is a retired professor of English who taught at a women's college in Kashmir for 34 years. So there are quite a few women academics in Kashmir. Um, and, and uh, you know, quite a few Kashmiri women academics in other parts of the world as well. Now, I have been very fortunate to enjoy the emotional and political support of progressive people, not just in my home state, but in my adopted country as well. And that has given me a lot of exposure that has put me in touch with people who espouse democratic principles, who espouse the emancipation of women, who espouse a liberatory discourse that would facilitate the self-determination of people, in particular women. And I have been fortunate to, uh, to get published by very good presses in this country. I have been writing for national newspapers as well as local English newspapers in Kashmir since 2005 now. So uh, that has helped me to put my name out there. And then also, to be very honest with you, the fact that I have a political background mm -hmm. piques curiosity and piques interest. Um, and I was, I probably am more mobile than a lot of women academics who live in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. Um, so that mobility gave me access to educational institutions that were removed from the capital city, which is where my family lives. Mm -hmm. And I was able to go to those places to meet with people, to make presentations, deliver mm -hmm. lectures, etc. Mm -hmm. So the mobility factor um, helped a lot. Mm -hmm. 
which not everyone enjoys. Right. right. Yeah. Well, and again, not just not just there. <laughs> yeah, not yeah. just there. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and absolutely. Um, that's that's one thing that I think you know I've I'm, I've been pleased to see over the last twenty years or so. Uh, that the education of women worldwide is seen it, it, to be such an important thing in the development of, of uh, undeveloped uh, countries and to bring economies along. Well, I think it's very important for people to realize, especially those who, who subscribe to bigoted views, that no society can grow, no society can evolve without the full participation of educated women. And I think a fear that a lot of religious societies have is that educated women will veer away from or will undermine religion. But as we have seen historically, in movements for independence, for self-determination, even in the movement for India's independence from the British, I'm talking about pre-partition India's uh, fight against the British colonial power, we saw that liberated, emancipated women who fought shoulder to shoulder with men for independence and to build their nations, mm -hmm. developed their political identities within a religious and familial framework. Mm -hmm. So the two are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. We can't the fear of absolutely yeah. the fear absolutely. of change for many the people. fear of change. Just overwhelming. Yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. I have to worry. Yeah. Well, our time is up. Not. Thank you so much for, for sharing again. Keep us informed of what's going on in Kashmir. Thank you and, so much, and, Rina. And hopefully we can raise some interest and some activity on the, in the global um, peace and human rights movement. I always enjoy talking with you, and I especially appreciate the fact that you were able to draw analogies between the situation in Kashmir and the political situation in the United States and other parts of the world. There are a lot of commonalities, and the more common ground we are able to create, the faster and more efficiently will we be able to resolve conflicts, political as well as religious. Well, that is certainly one of our goals here on Peace Buzz. Thank you again. Thank you, Lena. Bye-bye. Since our interview, Amnesty's main office in London released a statement which included this. No staff of Amnesty International India were involved in the alleged anti-national sloganeering at an event on human rights violations in Kashmir. We are an independent human rights organization that campaigns all over the world for states to comply with international human rights law and, accordingly, do not take a side on questions such as self-determination in a given context. But if others were involved in the alleged sloganeering, their human right to do so must be protected, as is made clear in India's own constitution. Unquote. We hope other American progressive news organizations will take up this important developing story. <music>
Welcome, Medea Benjamin. Hello. Hello. Good to see you, Nicole. Good to see you, too. I'm so glad you made it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you're here. Sorry. That that clip I was playing was from CNN uh, yesterday or the day before when video footage um, emerged from Aleppo where a, a, a housing development was bombed. And this five-year-old little boy was pulled out of the rubble just in shock. And it's, you know, there are there are thousands of that little boy. And it's often, you know, one picture captures you know, the conscience of America. And we get all upset over a picture. What We remember the little boy, uh, the, the refugee child who washed up on the beach that day. And, and for, you know, for a week or two, we were all, you know, we have these moments of... Um, conscience i guess and and then you know it goes by so quickly and then there's not another picture the next day and uh, it's out of sight out of mind and most americans just forget about the horrors of war um but medea benjamin you you travel to these places in the world and you see it all firsthand don't you well yeah and when you see it firsthand you don't forget you have these images seared in your mind and you keep thinking every day you have to keep doing this because uh, you remember that family, you remember the grandmother, you remember the daughter, you remember the child. And yeah, they, they go to bed with you and they wake up with you. They do. And, and you know, and while people would be well served to remember the face of that little boy, and I agree, the picture is heartbreaking. And you see, and you see the video, and he's just sitting there, obviously in shock, probably with a hell of a concussion, just, just a. It, not uh, with all this chaos around him and he's not even crying. It was nice to see humanity from a newscaster. Um, but I, I, I don't know where we go from here. How do we as a people stand by while this shit continues day in and day out? Because that's been going on, you know, nonstop. And we only see every now and then a, a piece of video like that gets to us and, and tugs at our heartstrings, but we don't do anything about it. Yeah, I mean, I've been working on the issue around Saudi Arabia and the weapons sales, and there is a case where it's our weapons and our logistics. And just in these last couple of days, the Saudis in Yemen have attacked a Doctors Without Border hospital. Uh, the fourth time they've attacked a Doctors Without Border hospital, a residential neighborhood killing a principal, his wife, four kids. And when the relatives came in to try to help out, uh, they did what's called a double tap. Another bomb comes in and kills the relatives. And then we hit a school and a potato factory, potato chip factory. So just in the course of less than a week, uh, U.S. bombs, U.S. logistical support, U.S. refueling of airplanes. Um, and that's directly our responsibility. In Syria, at least you can say uh, we are one of many and we're all responsible. The Russians, the uh, uh, obviously the, the different sides in Syria, uh, the Saudis, the Iranians, the U.S. Uh, there's unfortunately all kinds of wars being played out in Syria right now. But in the case of Yemen, it's the Saudis and it's our war. So let's talk about the Saudis, because obviously that's the, the topic of your new book. Medea Benjamin has a brand new book out called Kingdom of the Unjust Behind the U.S.-Saudi Connection. Um, so how far back does this go? Where, what, what, what story do you tell here? I start with the founding of the St Saudi state in 1932 wow. and tell a very simply written story about what Saudi Arabia is like today, what did the discovery of oil mean for this desert nation? And what uh, are the internal issues? How did the Saudi ruling regime treat its own people uh, or treat the millions of migrant workers who are wor working there? Uh, how? What's the situation of women, uh, minorities like the Shia minority, and uh, anybody who tries to dissent what happens to them. And then I go into the international issues, the spread of Wahhabism, this very mm -hmm. intolerant form of Islam that's practiced in Saudi Arabia, how that uh, became spread throughout different parts of the world and became the ideological basis of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And then look at the long-standing U.S. relationship and uh, why it exists today and, and what we can do about it. 
Now, just a, a few weeks ago, we actually got the, the 28 pages released that have been sitting in the uh, National Archives under lock and key, top secret, no one could see it, that allegedly told us of Saudi Arabia's uh, role, perhaps, in, in the 9-11 attacks. Um, did it tell us what we thought it was going to tell us? Well, it depends. If you wanted to see some direct evidence that there were um, clear connections between Saudi hijackers and high-level ruling people, well, possibly not. If you wanted to see their uh, connections between the uh, hijackers and people that were part of the Saudi government, including in the intelligence community, uh, yes. And I think uh, as a... Um, a person who had been waiting for um, many years, 14 years to be precise, to read that. Um, I learned a lot of things that I didn't know before. And I think um, what is important to also recognize is how the administration timed the release after 14 years to coincide with a Friday afternoon mm -hmm. when Congress was going out on vacation for the summer and when the Democratic and Republican conventions were just about <laughs> right. to s start. So you know that people sat in a room and thought, when can we release this when nobody's going to pay attention to it? And that was precisely the time. And so it either got swept under the rug or it was spun, thanks to the spin masters that the Saudis pay a lot of money to, uh, to say, oh, we didn't learn anything new. We already knew these connections existed. So I think the important thing, Nicole, is to recognize that there are lots of connections, starting with 15 of the 19 hijackers are Saudis. Um, people training right here in Florida uh, right. with connections to people in the Saudi embassies and the Saudi consulates. And the Saudi ideology is the one that gave Osama bin Laden uh, his uh, anti-Western hatred. So, you know, how many connections do you need to the Saudi government? Well, good question. And yet we still send the Saudi Arabia a lot of money every year. It's like it's almost we can we can say whatever we want about anybody else in that region of the world but not Saudi Arabia. It's a hands-off policy on them. And uh, does that go back to the Bush family? Because the Bush family and uh, the, the Saudi royal family have a, a long-standing connection, don't they? Yeah, I just wanted to go back and correct the first statement you okay. made, that we send them a lot of money. Um, they send us a lot of money. They do. And that's where the yeah. uh, real connection is. It's not like Israel or Egypt, where we are giving them billions of dollars of uh, military equipment because it, it uh, props up our military industrial complex. Uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia, they are paying us for that. And so, yes, it still props up the military industrial complex, but it does more than that. It brings in, uh, it just under the Obama administration, it was over $100 billion in weapon sales oh. in contracts, the largest ever in the history of the United States. And then they, we buy their oil, which we don't need anymore. It's only about 13% of the oil we import. Um, but they recycle their petrodollars from the sale of oil all over the world into the United States. And so they're invested in U.S. treasuries. They're invested in U.S. companies. Uh, look at even Uber just got a $3.5 billion investment from the Saudi uh, royal uh, um, family. So um, they're, they're intertwined in our economy in a way that uh, makes it very difficult for the U.S. government to even do anything like support the 9-11 families who want to take the Saudis to court. And the Saudis have said, ah, ha, ha, you take us to court, we're going to pull out $750 billion worth of U.S. assets. And so they blackmail us. And I say this blackmailing has to stop, that we're not... Um, running our country in order to be um, bowing down to the repressive Saudi regime, we've got to run our country in what's best for the United States. And this alliance with the, so the Saudi regime is bad for our security. It's bad for our world. It keeps us on the fossil fuel treadmill that might destroy the world altogether. So we've got to, we've got to find ways to separate ourselves from the Saudi regime. Uh, uh, yes, we do. Your thoughts on the presidential election? Uh, well, you know, I'm an activist, and to be an activist, you have to have a, 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 an idea that things can change and that um, popular movements can have an influence. 
I would say that during the Obama administration, it was very hard being a peace activist because when Obama came in, people thought, okay, he's not George Bush. Things are going to get better. He's going to be the peace president. We don't have to worry about it. We don't want to protest the first black president, blah, 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 blah. And here we are almost eight years later now where we're involved in seven wars in the Middle East, where the U.S. is giving money to prop up these dictatorships from uh, Egypt to Honduras. And uh, I would say the bright side of it is that no matter who is in the White House in the next administration, people are not going to have the same illusions that it's going to be a peace president. And they're not going to say, "Okay, we can just ride this one out because they're going to do right by us. Um, They're going to have to organize, get involved. And so I see the rebirth of many movements, including the anti-war movement, And we're starting right now. We're not waiting. We have been, uh, that's part of why I'm doing this book tour is to say to people, come on, are you tired of uh, 14 years of war and 54% of discretionary funds of our our nation going to a bloated military that uh, keeps us in the state of, uh, of, of war and doesn't deal with the issue of terrorism? In fact, it it makes it worse. Uh, Or do you want to try something different? Do you want to push our leaders that they actually use political solutions and diplomacy and roll back uh, the 800 military bases that we have around the world that don't keep us safe? In fact, just the opposite. Uh, There's so much that we could do to uh, free up billions and billions and billions in resources that we need for a good health care system in this country, oh. free education, the rebuilding of our infrastructure, you know, moving us into the green economy, all of these things. Where is the money? The money is in the Pentagon. The F-35, a weapon system we don't need, a big boondoggle, a trillion dollar boondoggle, upgrading our nuclear weapons system, what we don't need in the world, supposed to cost us another trillion dollars. We are spending so much money on so many things we don't need because there is this weapons, uh, this military industrial complex that has a stranglehold uh, on us, on our elected officials, and uh, we've got to loosen that stranglehold and free up the money for things that we can actually use. That's why we need activism. That's why we need people who don't give up, uh, that no matter if it's Democrats or Republicans in power, we got to be there fighting the power. We do. We do. And it's important to keep uh, speaking up as you do. Medea Benjamin, I love what you do. I love that you stand up and you, you demand to be heard and people have to listen to you. The book is called Kingdom of the Unjust Behind the U.S.-Saudi Connection. Right now, Medea Benjamin's in Florida. Where do you go to after that? Uh, I'll be going all through Florida and then starting up in the in New England area. Oh, wow. Nice. Okay, well, fall in New England yes. is beautiful. Thanks Medea Benjamin, I'm so good. Thank you for coming by. It's so great to see you, and and I can't wait to read the book. I, I'm sure it's available at all the usual places where you buy books. Uh, yes, and on the Code Pink website and CodePink.org. The Code all right, thank you, Medea Benjamin. Thank you so yeah. much. Well, that's it for this episode of Peace Buzz. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, please share via social media or email. If you would like to comment about the show, listen to past episodes, or suggest future topics, please visit peacebuzz.org. Thanks to Nyla Ali Khan for giving so generously of her time and insights. Find her books and other writings listed at nylaalikhan.org. She also is frequently published on counterpunch.com. Thanks also to Nicole Sandler for the clips from her show, which can be found on NicoleSandler.com. We'd also like to acknowledge the support of Broad Spectrum Radio, which provides extended distribution for this program. Finally, thanks to Susan McCann for her hospitality. Peace Buzz is a production of Upwave Media, which is a project of the Center for Conscience in Action. Learn more at CenterForConscience.org. Thank you.